so we are so excited to present our upcoming releases, so you can add them to your endless TBR. Into the Light is a coming-of-age lace, dark, twisty mystery set in Idlewild, California. It is about uh, queer resilience, and uh, of course the other side of queer resilience is queer trauma, so it's about that as well. And it's also about faith and crises of faith. It's uh, two characters, one who doesn't remember anything, but believes everything that he said, or that he's like raised with, and one who has questioned everything, and their old secrets are coming up. I'm so excited to present Terry J. Benton Walker's Fantasy YA debut, Blood Deaths, and this is set in a magical New Orleans and just chock full of romance, power, and murder. <laughs> Readers can expect a magical system deeply rooted in culture, a juicy murder mystery, complex family dynamics, black gay romance, and powerful families battling for control of the magical community of contemporary New Orleans. Anna Leonowitz's Terraformers. I'm sure many of you are very excited for this one. So James S.A. Corey, author of the Expand series, says this is so engaging you could almost miss the pyrotechnic world building and bone deep intelligence. Newitz continues doing some of the best work in the field. This will take you on a journey spanning thousands of years and exploring the triumphs, strife, and hope that finds us whenever we make our home. This book is truly Kim Stanley Robinson meets Becky Chambers with visionary science on a grand scale, as well as endearing dimensional characters, including humans, robots, and a sentient train that will capture your entire heart. Okay, James yeah. Rollins. Um, you may know him as a huge best-selling thriller author, but last year Tor published his first fantasy ever, The Starless Crown. He called it his magnum opus. It's the story he said he's always wanted to write. It's more than 500 pages, so we're very excited that next year it's coming out in paperback. You can make a little more room on your bookshelf for book two in the series, which is Cradle of Ice. Not going to spoil the first book, but just suffice it to say that this is full of the same pulse-pounding action that you maybe read in the first book. The unlikely allies who teamed up in book one are back together, but this time they're going to have to split up as they return to the capital and once again try to save the world. So they can't catch a break, but we get to read all about it, which is great. From dystopian visionary and best-selling phenomenon Veronica Roth, comes a razor-sharp reimagining of Antigone. Yes, that Antigone. <laughs> um, so what I'm basically trying to say is that this is post-apocalyptic Antigone in space, and I don't know what else you need from me. Um, I mean, let's be honest, what ancient classic wouldn't be improved by setting to space? There's really not much more to say about this if you like Veronica Roth, if you're into all the reimagined Greek classics, that seems to be all the rage these days. Keep an eye out for this one. Okay, I'm back to talk about The Warden. I'm so excited for this book. This is a book for people who love Twin Peaks, but would love Twin Peaks even more if it had wizards, which I think is everyone probably. I also have in Pretend this is in a Stefan voice. I think we have to make like a Stefan reference every time we do one of these panels, but this book has everything. <laughs> There's nonstop high stakes action, a reluctant hero, quests, quirky small town cast of characters, uh, mythology, great evil, necromancers, and a lot of bisexual chaos. We have a bi main <laughs> character and two of, their, of her ex-lovers who she has to leave for aforementioned small town with the quirky characters. It's incredible. You're not going to want to miss it. Yeah, it sounds like y'all are already familiar with TJ Klum. So of course you know about House in the Cerulean Sea and the Extraordinaries and how he styles himself as Book Daddy on Twitter. Um, we're talking about In the Lives of Puppets. Uh, this is his next standalone fantasy. It is a story about a family assembled from spare parts, sometimes literally. Vic Lawson is a human who lives with a sadistic nurse machine, an attention-seeking mobile vacuum, you know, the little circle ones, and fatherly inventor android Geo Lawson. Vic finds another android and repairs this android, and they kind of got a flame going on, but it's a little complicated because this uh, repaired android has a sort of dark past with Geo Lawson, and what follows is eventually a adventure to try to save Geo, but also to figure out if we can save ourselves and if we, you know, can accept complicated love. Speaking of complicated love, 
Under the Whispering Door is releasing in paperback. And if you love good books about bad characters, this one is a hoot. Wallace is, he, he sucks. Um, he's also dead. He's also dead, but he doesn't like get it at first. He's at his own funeral and he's just being the worst. And then eventually, eventually he's like, oh wait, like, this is mine. And um, it's a queer love story about how it's never actually too late to live a little bit better and find a little bit of love. And the love story is between uh, the, the ghost of Wallace and Fairy Man, who runs a supernatural tea shop, so it's pretty great. And we're actually not done with TJ Klune, this isn't pictured. So this is actually where I get in a little bit of trouble. I love working at Tor, but my, my one complaint is we don't have enough books about werewolves, and luckily we are fixing that by acquiring TJ Klune's Green Creek series. So if you like werewolves, and if you love gay werewolves, um... <laughs> So, Cory Doctorow is back with the next Tuesday thriller about cryptocurrency shenanigans. Um, a little week of you to how the world really works. Martin Hench is 67, single, and, contain your excitement, a self-employed forensic accountant. He is a veteran of the long guerrilla war between people who want to hide money and people who want to find it. He's not famous, except to the people who matter. Now he's being roped into a job that is more dangerous than anything he's ever agreed to before, and it'll take every ounce of his skill to get out alive. So, if you're a fan of Cory Doctor and you've been waiting for his next book, keep an eye out for this in April. This might be the only context that cryptocurrency. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll actually learn how cryptocurrency works. No. <laughs> So, in the same way that Neil Gaiman made squabbling deities sexy in American Gods, this Springs Arcana takes Russian folklore to the next level. This is Baba Yaga in a power suit, if that entices. So, Lilith St. Crow is, has written an incredible book about a woman desperately trying to save her mother. And even better, fans don't have to wait long for the second book in this duology. I love when Tor does this, which we kind of do this frequently, but book two is coming out just a few months after book one, so it's going to be fresh in your mind, you're going to be ready to pick up book two, and no spoilers, obviously, about the first one talking about the second one, but suffice to say they're both full of magic and very hungry divinities. Oh, and um, Chuck Wendig said of this author that St. Crow does not fuck around. So, pardon my French, but this is true. She, she doesn't fuck around. <laughs> Fractalverse First Contact, household author Christopher Pellini fills in more of his expansive space opera universe that he began with To Sleep in a Sea of Stars. This is a story about the beginning. For millennia, we lived and died in Earth's cradle. Even centuries after embarking into the void, we were alone in the ice and black. But fans of the Fractalverse know there's more out there, and here it is. The burden was first theirs. Dr. Crichton and the research crew of the Atomura discovered the anomaly that changed everything, and this is their story. And it's also a great entry point into the Fractalverse as well. So you can read this and then To Sleep in a Sea of Stars, or if you've already read To Sleep in a Sea of Stars, you can still read this, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> this one's for fans of Addy and the Night Circus. And it's a queer historical fantasy between World War I and World War II, perfect for fans of intimate and alluring stories. It's a hopeful story about a circus of outcasts, magic users, or sparks who travel through the U.S. Fans of the found family trope are going to absolutely love this one, and so will fans of T.J. Klune and T.K. Fisher. Julia V. and Kemba Bell are joining forces in Ebony Gate and what a tour de force is going to be. This book is for fans of John Wick, if John Wick were a retired lady assassin with dragon magic facing down an army of the dead in San Francisco. <laughs> the fearsome assassin, once known as the Butcher of Beijing, now has a quiet life in San Francisco, importing antiques. But when a Shinigami calls with the family blood debt, Emiko must recover the ebony gate that holds back the hungry ghosts of the underworld, or forfeit her soul as the anchor. Keep an eye out for this coming next summer. Hey, John Scalzi. You know him, you love him. He's the best. Anyway, this is his new book, He's back next summer with this standalone called Starter Villain, which tackles what might happen if a mysterious uncle leaves you a supervillain business. It's set in maybe the scariest 
setting yet, which is modern day Earth. Um, <laughs> and it's full of incredible supervillain tropes, which you can probably guess at, but I just want to call out um, sentient cats who serve as managers in this supervillain company. So I, I don't know. Yeah, that's all. That's all I need to read ever. And I already mentioned it's a standalone, so John Scalzi is a prolific author, so if you've been looking for an entry point, this is a great one. It's going to, you know, showcase all of his wit and action and everything that he can do so well. So, and then I should just reiterate, sentient manager cats. Yeah. <laughs> See you again, so Nightfire. If anyone's been looking for horror recommendations, this is going to be the part of the panel for you. So kicking things off with The Spite House, this is a debut that we're so excited about coming next year from Johnny Compton. He's a horror author. Yeah, so this book's incredible. It's a gothic horror story, but it's one of those horror stories that uses terrifying imagery as a launching point into some deeper topics like grief, or in this case, a father's undying love, but also just a horrifying haunted house. So watch out for this next summer. Keep an eye on Johnny Compton. Yeah, it's incredible. I love Lucy Ace Naidoo's sister made of monster. That's basically everything I love most about horror, which means it's visceral, delightfully gross, those are two different things, and unrelentingly scary. A virus burns across the globe and transforms its victims in nightmarish ways, and to survive, a group of affected women band together. Erin, once quiet and closeted, acquires an appetite for a woman, and also her brain, which is awkward. <laughs> Uh, Savannah, all right, a professional BDSM switch discovers a new turn on, committing brutal murders for her eldritch masters. I'm sure some of y'all in here can relate. Uh, don't worry, I work for a corporation, so I can too. <laughs> And too far to acknowledge her divine role in the coming apocalypse. What comes after the end of the world? Sister, maiden, monster. The salt grows heavy, also the cover is everything. Um, if you know Cassandra Call, you might know them from Nothing But Black and Teeth, which debuted with us. And this time, they are bringing us murderous mermaids teaming up with a plague doctor, and lots of murder. Murder, murder, murder. Um, <laughs> and it also comes out around the same time as the Little Mermaid movie. No relation at all, but I just think that's really funny. <laughs> By day, Mayfly works in the happiest place on Earth as everyone's favorite ice princess. No, we're not naming names with getting in trouble for that. <laughs> By night, she stalks the Sunset Strip, and her victims do not see her in the shadows. But something is coming for cynical, disenchanted, nihilistic Maeve. Something that she was never prepared for. She falls in love. <laughs> Brady Hendricks called this book an apocalyptic Anaheim psycho. Stephen Graham Jones said that Cormac McCarthy's Child of God has nothing on Mayfly. Step aside, Patrick Bateman. Serial killing's no longer a boys' club. It's Maeve's turn with the knife. <laughs> as Gay T-Rex Law Firm, Executive Boner, and Pounded in the Butthole by my concept of linear time. Two of my favorites. Um, but this isn't dinosaur erotica. Now, Chuck turns his talent for writing stories that transport us to where we're most vulnerable to a new genre, horror. Tour Nightfire is so excited to bring y'all Camp Damascus, a novel of a novel of horror. In Neverton, Montana, there's a God-fearing place where life free from sin awaits. Camp Damascus is a story about the figurative and literal demons faced by the American queer community, and it will scare the hell out of you. Did you ever go to camp? But... What? Please admit. <laughs> I, as someone who did go to church camp as a kid, oh my. it's very good. And, you know, you, the book. <laughs> I did go to some good church camps, so I'm fine. <laughs> we went hiking and kayaking, and that was fun. <laughs> After La The Last House on Mila Street, and Sundial, and Little Eve, Catriona Ward is back and better than ever with Looking Glass Sound. In a lonely cottage overlooking the windswept Maine coast, Wilder Harlow begins the last book he will ever write. It is the story of his childhood's summer companions and the killer that stalked the small New England town of the body they found and the horror of that discovery echoing down the decades, and of Skye, Wilder's one-time best friend, 
who stole his unfinished memoir and turned it into a lyric best-selling novel, Looking Glass Sound. But as Wilder writes, the lines between memory and fiction blur. He fears he's losing his grip on reality when he finds notes hidden around the cottage written in Sky's signature green ink. This is the new, newest, cleverly crafted, mind-bending psychological horror novel from the mind of Catriona Ward. I'm excited to introduce the latest from Woo! Sean and McGuire. Uh, I heard some, uh, you know Sean and you love Sean, she's the best. So this is the eighth installment in her Wayward Children series. These are incredible also because they all work as standalone. So if you're not familiar with the series, you can jump in at this point, you can go back to the beginning. They're also all novellas, so quick incredible reads and you can read them over and over again, which you're going to want to do. This one has great coming of age elements. Uh, it's about a daughter kind of searching for her father and herself. You can expect, you know, the very best in world building and magic from Shauna and this book is just more of that. So you're not going to want to miss it. So much adored for her middle grade work, Kelly Barnhill has been making strides in adult speculative fiction uh, with 2014's Dreadful Young Ladies and this year's When Women Were Dragons. Now, in a twisty retelling of a beloved fable, sacrifices are made for love of art and family. The setting is an eerie take on the near-future U.S. Midwest, a location riddled with somatic anxiety as deceptively open rural spaces are rendered inaccessible by drone patrols and privatization. From out of this uneasy environment stalks the crane. In Kelly's words, I didn't mean to write this story. I wrote the first sentence, and the rest poured out unbidden. Some stories are like that. They catch us and hold us down and refuse to tell us their intentions. It's too late. The crane husband explores themes of motherhood, coming of age too soon, generational abuse, and the commingled beauty and dread that underpin transformative art. Malka Older, author of the critically acclaimed Sentinel Cycle, has returned with the mimicking of known successes. This book somehow manages to be a cozy Holmesian murder mystery, a lyrical meditation on planetary belonging, and a sapphic romance set on Jupiter. It has the range. <laughs> In a remote human, col human colony on Jupiter, a man goes missing. The enigmatic investigator Masa follows his trail to Valdegel, home to the colony's university and Moss's former girlfriend, a scholar of Earth's pre-collapsed ecosystems. Together, the two must navigate the labyrinthine mystery of the man's disappearance and their feelings for each other if they are to discover the future. Prepare to enter the forever desert. The Lies of the Ajungo is an action-packed fable that follows a young boy as he travels into the desert to find water and discovers horrid secrets and deadly battles. Moses' debut reads like a folktale by way of a martial arts movie with crisp action, brutal sensibilities, and sharp allegory throughout. It is the first in, the tri in a trilogy and opens the curtain on a tremendous world and begins the epic fable of the forever desert. Okay, some desperate glory. This is a debut coming next year that no one in-house has been able to shut up about for months. Uh, we're all so excited for this book, and you should be too. So it's Emily Tesh's queer space opera debut featuring young soldiers. Um, it's about the wreckage of war. There's also found family, snarky friendships, and just a powerful story about what it means to be a young woman in a universe at war. If you're into fan fiction, Gideon, I saw there's a Gideon here somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Gideon. Uh, sorry, Gideon the Ninth. Okay. Uh, or She Rat, this book is for you. And speaking of Gideon, Tamsin Muir called this book Mass Effect Beating Up Brave New World in a Dark Alley. And also <laughs> Shelley Parker Chan said that it is. Ender's Game for people who love Ender's Game, but it didn't necessarily love them back. So, no. some of the best just no. quotes about this book already. We're so excited. Don't miss this next year. Giant murder birds. That is what I have to say about this one. I hate birds, so um, I don't know. I'm going to be scared probably reading this. But Untethered Sky follows Esther as she trains, hunts with, and kills manacores alongside her very large, very murderous rock. We love Murder Bot. That's all I have to say about any of these books. Um, but you, so you should know Martha Wells. You love Martha Wells. This is a very exciting book for us because it's her first fantasy in more than ten years. 
So great news for all of us. <laughs> Kai is our main character, and he is having a long day because he's been murdered, and <laughs> his consciousness has been imprisoned in an elaborate water trap. So from beyond the grave, he, his consciousness has been dormant. He has to figure out why he was trapped in the first place, why maybe some evil forces are becoming more powerful, what's been going on in the world, and ultimately whether he can bring his allies and friends together to figure out any of these answers. So yeah, if you've read Murder Mountain, this has all of the wit and charm that you might expect in these relatable characters that you might expect from Martha Wells, and it also has huge cinematic scope of incredible fantasy. So you're not gonna wanna miss it. Hey, what is my favorite cover? This book is so good. Undying is the first volume of the Downworld sequence, a sci-fi series where AI deities in brutal police states clash and use mechas steered by pilot priests with corrupted bodies as their weapons of choice. Mm. This is a story about misplaced faith and its lingering ghosts, complicated love, so much self-loathing, and yet giant robots. Plugged into his AI god when it corrupted and made him unfortunately immortal, sad gay disaster, Sunai has taken a die again or die trying approach to his unending life. <laughs> then he drops into bed with the most dangerous man in the world, and what follows is brain-meltingly thrilling sci-fi that I describe as careless whisper era George Michaels doing a bass-boosted soundtrack to Neon Genesis Evangelion. <laughs> so... Emphasis on the brain-melting. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a literal plot. <laughs> and Saint of Bright Doors. When Fetter was born, his mother tore his shadow from him. She raised him as a weapon to kill his sainted father and destroy the religious cults that his father had founded. Now Fetter is 20-something, disillusioned, and attends a support group for unchosen ones. And like many disillusioned 20-somethings, Fetter has come to a big city to reinvent himself. But everywhere in Luriac are these strange, unopenable, brightly painted doors. No one knows what lies beyond them, but everyone has their own theory. Researchers perform tests and take samples, while supplicants offer fruit and flowers and hold prayer circles. And Fetter might just be able to open them. The Saint of Bright Doors is by far one of the weirdest but, and strangest but most beautiful books I've read all year. It's got divine assassins and transcendent cults, it's got devils and anti-gods and the horrors of paperwork and contemporary bureaucracy. The South Asian Fantastic is absolutely a genre to keep your eyes on. And that's a wrap.